Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. My name is Joe Monahan. I want to welcome you. On behalf of myself, our associate pastor Kathleen Stoles, and the entire congregation here, it's good to see you this morning. I hope each one of you will take a minute. There's a red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew. I hope that you'll pick that up, pass that down to the end, and then back to the center. It's one of the ways that we get to know one another's names. And if you are visiting with us today, maybe for the first time, I hope you'll take some time the bottom of the page to share with us your contact information so that we can let you know about things that are going on here at the church. I want to share with you a couple of announcements. Um, I encourage you to take a look through the bulletin to understand everything that's going on uh, over the next couple of weeks, but I hope that just by lifting up a few things, I might draw your attention to them. So the first thing is we have a family dinner and movie night uh, planned for next Saturday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Family Life Center. And uh, so it is an, a dinner of tacos and so everybody loves tacos, right? So you do have to RSVP. Um, you RSVP to Bethany. She's seated right up here. And uh, you can send her an email <clears throat> and uh, about 6 uh, to about 9 o'clock. And so we invite you to come. And the, uh, and the The movie is called God's Not Dead. That's the name of the movie. Um, sorry. You get to a place where it's like you're in the zone and things are operating well, and then, boom, a little distraction. God was telling you that he wasn't dead. Yeah, right. Every time a bell rings, Angel gets his point. <laughs> All right. So um, we also have our special church conference coming up on Wednesday evening. Uh, that's April the 10th at 7 o'clock. We have two uh, pieces of business that we need to transact there. And the first one is we're going to uh, approve uh, the organization of an endowment fund, a permanent endowment fund, to help support the trustees in their work of caring for our properties. So that's the first order of business. And then the second thing that we need to do is to approve uh, the general terms and conditions of our uh, conversion from an interest-only loan that we've been dealing with while we've been in the, fundra the construction and fundraising uh, mode for the Family Life Center over to a permanent mortgage. So we're in the process of doing that and hope to do that in the next month or so. So uh, those are two things. And then the third thing that's going to be part of that is that we're going to have the opportunity to meet our new, uh, our incoming district superintendent, the Reverend Hector Burgos, and uh, we're looking forward to having him with us uh, here on Wednesday evening. That's going to take place in, in uh, Boker Hall. Uh, finally, I want to share with you just a couple notes about the schedule. Obviously, during Holy Week, we've got a lot of, a lot of things going on all kinds of different opportunities. We have our prayer vigil. Um, we have the labyrinth that's going to be set up. And we'll talk more about all the Holy Week services next week. But just so that you know, on Palm Sunday, our schedule is going to be our normal schedule, 8, 15, 9, 30, and 11. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we will also add a sunrise service at 6.30, followed by a breakfast. Now, one of the things that's going to be different this year about the sunrise services, in the past few years, we've been right out here in front of the church we actually have the opportunity now to worship in a brand new uh, outdoor chapel. It's not brand new in the sense um, it's the one that used to be down here, but we've picked it up and relocated it and refurbished it. Um, so it used to be kind of here on the hillside, and now it's been moved back here into the woods. But it's in a place that's it's very flat, um, that it's easy to get to, and we hope that it'll be both accessible and usable. And so uh, we think that this is going to provide us with a nice space uh, to have our outdoor uh, sunrise service next, uh, well, two weeks from today on Easter Sunday. So that's going to take place. We really thank um, Scott Minshaw and his uh, troop. Uh, he, this is going to be his Eagle Scout project. And so I'm really grateful uh, for, to him for undertaking that work on our behalf. Uh, I think that those are all the announcements for today. So uh, let's continue on. Kathleen? Good morning. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable and able and join me in our call to worship. Jesus said, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Even stones declare God's praise. And what about us? What will we do? What will we do for God who breathed air into the lungs of Adam, new life into dry bones, and the spirit into our congregation? We will be witnesses to God's greatness. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We will learn to live as Jesus lived. And the apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. We are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of our faith. Who will be a witness for our God? Who will tell the nations of God's goodness? We We will. will. seated. I invite you now to join me in our opening unison prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Amen. And the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment now to greet those around us with the peace of Christ.
That was beautiful. And they are really talking about what we are talking about today. They are singing their witness. They're singing their witness. So children, would you like to come up and talk to me about witnesses? Come on, we're going to figure out what a witness is. Come on. Well, you know what? Let's go over here where there's some more kids since nobody else is coming, Scarlett, okay? Okay? Let's go over here. You can sit there, and we'll talk about what witnesses are. Okay? Do you know what a witness is? Did you ever hear that word before? Okay, well, Tim's got an idea what a witness is. What's a witness? Um, a witness is like when you see something like really bad happening. It could be you see something really bad happening, or it could be something that you see really good happening. And the reporter goes up to you and says, tell us what you saw, right? Tell us what you saw. So if you think of, about something that you know is true, maybe you saw it, or maybe somebody else saw it and told you about it. Can you think of anything that fits that? Something you know is true, absolutely true. What do you think is absolutely true? Anything? Your name, your birthday, what color hair you have, are those things true? Right, yeah, those things are true. So when you see it happen, or if somebody told you about it, you know it's true. So the disciples saw what Jesus did, so they knew it was true. And then it was written down in the Bible, so we can read about it, and we can have people tell us about it, and now we know it's true. And then the next step is, after you know it's true, you need to go tell somebody. You need to tell somebody it's true. Okay, so can you think of any lessons you learned in Sunday school? Anything at all? One lesson you learned in Sunday school. One lesson, okay. Okay, so you learned about Ezekiel. So you could tell someone about Ezekiel because now your teachers told you and you can tell somebody else. What's one other thing that you maybe learned in Sunday school or in church or in the choir? Um, how, like, how you can tell people about Jesus. Okay, God is like a shepherd. And we can be either sheep or goats. You're right. And we know what those things mean, so we can tell other people. What's another one? You learn from choir that Jesus rose from the dead. And we talk about that in Sunday school, and we learn it in church. We hear about it, and we hear about it from the sermons, and we read about it in the Bible. And so for people, for years and years and generations and generations, have been telling these stories. And that's what witnesses do. We keep telling those things that we know are true. So one of the things I bet you know is true is that Jesus loves you, right? Do you remember that song? Yes. Can you sing it with me? Well, see if you can sing along with me, okay? Because I'll bet you've done this somewhere along the way. And I'll bet all of you have learned this song too. So here we go. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. See, you all know that. So you can tell others. You are witnesses to the fact that Jesus loves you. And you know what? And there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> So let's take a moment and pray. Would you repeat after me? Dear God, Dear God thank you for sending your Son. Help us to be witnesses so that others will know His love as we do.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Thank you too. You can go back now. A reading from Luke, chapter 19, verses 37 through 48. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees of the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that were make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, indeed, the day will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Then he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day was teaching in the temple, 
the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were spellbound by what they heard. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. So as we've gone through uh, the season of Lent, and uh, we've been talking about discipleship and what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. And the way that we've approached that is by looking at the membership vows that we uh, take whenever we join the church, whenever we have someone baptized in the church. Um, we always talk about these vows. And so far we've talked about prayers, presence, gifts, and service. And this week we're talking about witness. Now one of the things that's interesting about the idea of witness, I know that when we say that, well, witness feels maybe a little uncomfortable. We don't know 100% what it means. It seems a little opaque to us. And what I'm always reminded of <clears throat> whenever I hear this word and whenever we go through this ritual is how this ended up in our hymnal to begin with, or didn't end up in our hymnal, I guess I should say. You know, a few years ago, uh, in 20, 2008, uh, we had a general conference, and one of the concerns that we had was that our faith needs to be more visible in the world. And that maybe we're not necessarily living it out in the ways that we should beyond the walls of the church. So there was a movement to add this one word to our liturgy to say, not only do we pledge to support the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, but we also pledge to support the church through our witness. We had fully intended at that point to uh, create a new hymnal. But one of the things that's kind of funny along the way is we never ended up making that new hymnal. We still haven't created that new hymnal. So every time that we do a baptism and I'm reading out of the hymnal, I have to remember that that word, even though it's not there, it's there. And we put it up on the screen, so if you're, not, if you're just falling from the screens, you would never know the difference. But every time I go through this, I'm always reminded of this thing that I experienced when I was in college. I was the president of an uh, honor society. And when we inducted new people, we would uh, share with them the motto of the organization, which was a secret, for whatever reason. Because that's what you do when you're in college, I guess. But when you got to that place in the ritual, Literally, it was, and furthermore, the motto shall never be written. And it was blank. And every time we get to that place, I always think about the place in, that, in the liturgy where I have to say witness. I always think about that. It's like you have to know that it's there. You have to know that that word's there. But ironically, this idea, this hidden or secret knowledge is exactly the opposite of what the word witness was trying to convey by putting it in there in the first place. Was because the whole idea of it is that our faith is supposed to become visible. And yet now, due to the fact that it's not even in the hymnal, it's hidden. So what's that say to us? So today I want to explore a little bit this idea of, of witness. I know that that's a long introduction, but every once in a while I like to walk down memory lane. Let's take a moment, let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful for all that you've done for us. We're grateful for the opportunity to uh, share our gifts and our witness in the world. And we are grateful for the way that you speak uh, a word into our lives. And we pray that you might speak a word over us and in us this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I hope that my kids will never say to me expect it may happen at some point, but one of the names that I hope that my kids will never use for me is hypocrite. Dad, you're a hypocrite. These are words I hope that I never hear from my children's mouths. Now, some of you have already been there and done that probably at some point over some issue. And we can easily chalk this up to the idea, well, you know, when you're young, because we've all been young, right? We all understand what it is to be very idealistic and see things in very black and white terms. And so when things don't live up to our idea of what things should be, then automatically we, we go to the idea of, well, there's hypocrisy here. And it's easy for us to kind of chalk up when, 
young people around us offer a critique of what we're doing or how we're living and say, well, you don't understand. As you get older, you know, you start to see things in shades of gray. But the reality is we need to pay close attention when somebody points out to us that there might be some hypocrisy in the way that we're approaching our lives. And the reason why it's important for us to pay attention is because of all the things that Jesus talked about, it seems to me that this is the thing that he condemned in the harshest terms, was religious hypocrisy. Now, if you don't believe me, I would encourage you to take a look at something like Matthew chapter 23, which is just a series, a litany, essentially, of woes to the religious leaders during Jesus' day where he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That's how each one of these things starts. Now, it's not just in Matthew. We find it in other places as well, but that's where it jumps out most clearly. Hypocrisy is something that we need to avoid, something that's important for us to think about. And the way that it relates to the idea of witness is that... <clears throat> You know, when we talk about what it means to be a witness, just like Kathleen was saying, the basic expectation of a witness in a court of law is that they speak the truth. Would you agree with me? That's kind of the basic requirement to be a witness. And so what I think that witnessing is really about is speaking true words about God, living in a true way, according to our beliefs. Essentially, it's the idea of having integrity in our words, in our actions, in our beliefs, so that these things all line up with each other. So that there's a line that we can draw that goes through all of them and connects. And when there's something outside that line, then what happens is, that's when our young people look at our lives and say, wait a minute, what's going on with this? That idea of living true and speaking true. True words about God, true words according to what we believe and what we know about who God is and how God's at work in the world. Now, why is this important? <clears throat> well, I really, I'm just reflecting back what some of the conversations that I've been in here in the church, in my office, with people that I know, over especially the past month. This idea of witness has become something very important for us as United Methodists. So especially in the wake of the General Conference, the question that people have, and especially those who are more progressive in terms of the way that they approach the world, the question that they're asking themselves, and maybe you have asked it yourself, I know that I have asked it, is what does it mean for my witness to be part of the United Methodist Church right now, in this moment? What does it mean? I've had this conversation with people in the church. I've had a conversation with people outside the church. I've had a conversation with my family. And what does it mean right now, given where we are? What does it say to my friends and my family who are gay to show up in church on Sunday morning? And what's interesting, I know that had we, you know, had the vote gone the other way, I know that I would have been having the same conversations from a different perspective with a different group of people. But still around the same kind of questions is what does it mean to be associated with this particular denomination in this particular time, in this particular place? That been the same conversation, just kind of a mirror image because we understand intuitively that it's important to us to express what we believe through what we do. It's fascinating to think about, you know, that some of the conversations that I've had have been with uh, people who maybe go out to lunch or go out to breakfast with people that they know that belong to different churches and they have heard news reports and they say kind of what's going on with you United Methodists, what's the deal, you know, over there? And people, regardless of where they stand, on some level having to defend their involvement with the church. That's kind of the 
question that people have been bringing to me. And that's hard. There's no question about it. It's hard. So that's why I'm talking about witness. You know, the church has always debated what does it mean to live as a Christian? Always. And everywhere. You see it in Paul's letters when he's writing uh, to the churches and they have questions. Can we accept this person or not? Here's what they're doing. What do you think? Right? We see it in the book of Acts when there are debates about practice in the early church and what's in and what's out and who's in and who's out. We see it in uh, the book of Revelation in the first uh, few chapters there are these famous letters that are dictated by the Spirit to these uh, various uh, churches in and around Asia Minor talking to them about you know, what's going well and what's not going so well. Here's what I commend in you. Here's what I don't think you ought to be doing. We find this throughout the New Testament. So it's an important thing for us to think about. I want to look at this passage, and this passage that we read today is actually a passage um, that normally would be read on Palm Sunday. Even though, interestingly enough, in Luke's Gospel there are no palms. Did you know that? There are no palms on Palm Sunday in Luke's Gospel. Somebody should have told him that, right? Call it Palm Sunday. Luke, wake up. So anyway, um, it's just about people spreading their garments on the road. So there's still this kind of celebratory air. There's still this marking of Jesus as royalty, as somebody who's special and different. It's just not palms. But this whole story is all about witness. As he was now approaching the path from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen. So they're offering their witness by praising God for everything that they had seen Jesus do. And then they say, Blessed is the king who comes in the name, the name of the Lord. So it's not just about what Jesus has done, but it's also about who Jesus is. So they're offering their witness on both of these points. Now, of course, the next thing that happens is, whenever there is a witness that's offered, invariably somebody will stand up to contradict that witness. And that's what's happening here. Then some Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. So there's this idea that happens that courage is really an important dimension of witness. Because without courage, we cannot live true. We cannot speak truth. Unless we have the courage to deal with the fallout. You know this already. You've seen it. And Jesus dealt with it in his time as well. There are additional bits of witness in here. So as Jesus sees the city, the next thing that happens is he wept over it, saying, if you, even you, had only recognized this day the things that make for peace. And he goes on to talk about what will happen in years to come. And in fact, everything that he predicts comes to pass. So in 70 AD, the Romans come in, they destroy Jerusalem, they destroy the temple, and when he says not one stone will be left upon another, he's literally accurate. It took the Romans years. They devoted a whole lot of troops for years to tearing down the temple stone by stone and throwing it over the side of the hill on which it was built. That's why when you go, the only thing that's left is uh, the foundation wall that supported the platform on which the structure was built. And that's the western wall, the wailing wall, where you can go and pray today. Because the Romans tore it down to that level. Not one stone was left upon another. And when it says that Jesus wept, he's not just kind of gets a little teary and kind of wipes it and keeps going. What's being described here is He's really crying over this, like a professional mourner would cry. In those times, you hired professional mourners at a funeral. He's weeping and wailing over this city. He cares that much about it. So this whole thing is about witness. It's about the witness of the crowds. It's about the witness of Jesus. It's about what he has to offer. Our witness is important. And here's how I know that it's important. If I come back to this text, 
when the Pharisees say, tell your disciples to stop, what does Jesus respond with? He says, listen, if they are silent, you know what will happen? The stones themselves will cry out. In other words, if I can't get a witness in the crowd, there will be a witness. Make no mistake. Even creation will witness to what God is doing here in this place. There are many times when I despair about the church. Not our congregation, but like the capital C church. And there's lots of reason for that. It's not just because of what happened in February with our general conference, but when I look around, I don't think we tend to realize or think about the fact that when there is a scandal involving any church, I don't care what kind of church it is, what brand is on the door, it affects every single one of us. Because all people see is the church. Look at it. How can anybody be part of this corrupt institution? That's how people see it. And I really fear that we are in danger of losing maybe the next two generations. Seeing the church just fade into this kind of complete and utter irrelevance. I don't despair that Jesus will not be at work. I would never, ever think that. Because I really do believe that people still want to hear what Jesus has to say. People want to see what Jesus is about. People, if we can actually live out the gospel, they want to see that in us. Our witness is still important. It still matters. But people wonder when they look at the church, when they look at the stances we've taken, when they look at the things we've done, they wonder, can I trust this institution? I don't want to give my heart to that. I might give my heart to Jesus, but I'm not going to give it to that institution. And that's hard. That's the thing that we're working against every single day. So as witnesses, we are called to live true and act true according to what we understand the gospel to be. That's our calling. And it's never been more important than it is right now. So what I want to ask you to think about this week, what I want to challenge you to do this week, is every day, you know, I don't know what your routine is as you're getting ready to go to sleep at night, one of the things that many people do is they start to wind down and they kind of review their day in their minds. And maybe they pray over their day and they offer it to God in various ways. What I want to challenge you to do this week is to take some time in particular to look at your day through this lens of witness and ask yourself the question. Ask God the question. Where have I failed to live true, act true, speak true according to what I believe about who God is and what Jesus has done for me? Where have I failed to live into that truth? Where have I failed to be a witness? Now you might review your day and you might find day, times when you want to celebrate that you were able to be a witness and that's great. But I think all of us can find ways and times words that we've said, things that we left unsaid, where we fell short. We are in a time when the world needs to know that there is a witness. And what Jesus has said is, you know, if it's not going to be you, if it's not going to be me, if it's not going to be them, if it's not going to... Don't worry, I'll find a witness. If it's not you, if it's not me, even the stones will cry out. Even the stones will cry out. But I don't think that that's God's preferred path. 
I think that God would much prefer to see these words coming from you and coming from me, to see these actions coming from you and coming from me, so that the world might know that there is a witness to what God and Jesus has done in the world. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. And as we uh, continue to move towards Easter, we have a video uh, for our, to talk about our Easter food drive. So let's see uh, what's going on this week with our event. Abby, Abs, we're live. Oh, give me two seconds. Oh, oh. What's up, food fans? Once again, this is Abby Carl, and welcome to Food Center with our Spring Training Food Drive update. First of all, thank you to everyone who has already started to bring in food items, Acme gift cards, and toiletries. And also, thank you to those who have taken advantage of the online option by giving through the You Give Goods link on the church website. Also, we would like to wish a special EFDN happy birthday to former EFDN Food Center anchor and my wonderful older brother, Ben Carl. Food fans, we will still be collecting for one more week, concluding on Palm Sunday. And now, here's Outreach Chair Chris Carl with a voting update. Thanks, Abby. As of last Sunday night, March 31st, here are the vote totals. Our current leader is Jarvis Canton with 354 votes. Next is Rick the Razor Roberts with 316 votes. Just behind in third is Brianna Boxton with 304 votes. And in a distant last place is Casey the Gift Cards with two gift cards, a pitiful, pathetic 30 votes. Wait, wait, wait. So last year we had over 75 gift cards, and this year we have two? That's right. Two. <laughs> These players are working their hardest to make the team. Please continue to show support with your donations. Each Sunday night, we are recruiting in our youth helpers to count your votes by sorting and packing the food and toiletry items. And yeah, I'm not really sure what happened here. Back to you, Abby. Medford DMC, we only have one week left. Now is not the time for peanuts and Cracker Jack. Instead, it's time to get in your donations for this year's Easter food drive. We are in the seventh inning stretch and desperately need everyone to step up to the plate and help the families served by the Christian Caring Center and the Turning Point UMC Food Pantry. For Chris Carl, the MEMC Youth, the Outreach Committee, and all of us here at EFDN, the Easter Food Drive Network, I am Abby Carl signing off. Joe and Kathleen, the floor is yours.
right. So again, happy birthday, Ben. <laughs> and uh, so you heard it. Uh, we, so we need a lot of help on the gift card front. And uh, so 30 points, that means the two gift cards totaling a $30. So each, each dollar is a point. That's how it works? Yes. So um, we have a lot of work to do over the next week. And I want to thank you for your generosity. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, Acme, as opposed to ShopRite or someplace else, I mean, sometimes people will ask that, is because those are the, uh, the grocery stores that are available in the communities that are served uh, by this food drive. So I know it may be out of your way. Maybe you're normally a ShopRite person. Uh, you might have to go out of your way to go to the Acme to pick up those gift cards, but we would love to have your help with this. And uh, let's continue on our drive to Easter. And uh, right now we're going to receive an offering. We thank you very much for your support of the church, whether you give uh, electronically, whether you give by putting something in the plate. We thank you for your generosity. And if you are visiting today, maybe for the first time, we want to say thank you for being here. You don't need to feel obligated to put anything in the plate. We look forward to welcoming you back again soon. So let's continue now by offering God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
you join me now in our offering prayer. Lord, let our let congregation, our congregation be, be a witness to you, you. immersed in scripture, constant in prayer, joyful in worship, generous in giving, a loving, supportive community reaching out to those in need. Accept these gifts we offer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare to celebrate around the table, I'll remind you that the table does not belong to the United Methodist Church, but it belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he's the one who issues the invitation. That invitation is to all people who seek to live in a new relationship with God and with their neighbor through him. So all of you are welcome here. Today, uh, we'll receive by intinction, which means that you'll be given a piece of bread to dip in the cup. So as you come forward, uh, I invite you to be in prayer for the person who's in front of you in the line. We'll come by the center aisle and return by the side aisle. If you can't come forward for whatever reason, please let us know. We'll be sure to bring the elements to you. And um, we do have gluten-free uh, elements available. If that's something that you need, please just ask for it. They'll be available at your left-hand station. So let's continue with the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is um, right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And because you are so good, you are our gracious God, we have these joys and these thanksgivings to thank you for today. So joys and thanksgivings that we've got, other than this gorgeous spring day. Yes, amen. amen. You did a great job this morning. Thank you all. And it's Ben's birthday. Ben's birthday. <laughs> Bob's birthday. Happy oh. birthday to all those who are celebrating Happy birthdays. Birthday, yes. My daughter-in-law was in the hospital for 30 days. Oh, we celebrate that. Good. Yes. It's still going to be a long road, but prayers for We give thanks for the life of Marie Ireland and the celebration that was had for her yesterday. And so with your people on heaven and all your company of heaven, we praise your name and we join your unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. And we trust that when we gather together in his name around the table and we bring our prayers to you, that, that you hear us. And so as we gather this morning around this table and ready to celebrate this great communion feast, what prayers do you have on your hearts? We want to pray for Debbie Adams today, who's uh, been hospitalized and uh, is undergoing some testing. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 We also want to pray for uh, those who uh, are deploying and have been deployed here recently. Amen. And finally, Lord, we thank you for your son. And we thank you for all that his coming means for our lives and for our world. 
By the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. And you delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you gave with us and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and he shared it with his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise then, when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He shared it with his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. And now pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Now by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God now and forever. Amen, Amen, Amen. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite those who will be serving to come forward and join us here at the table.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the bounty that has been shared with us this day, for the gift of bread and fruit of the vine that strengthens us, that nourishes us, so that we might go and tell others about the abundance in our lives because of your love. So may this food nourish us and strengthen us to be your witnesses wherever we go. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are sent forth into the world to be witnesses, witnesses to what God has done in our lives, witnesses to the risen Christ who sends us forth to serve others. Go forth in the love, in the power, in the name of Christ. Speak true words to undertake uh, true actions that show how much you are loved and how much God calls us to love others. Go forth in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen.